really tough time slot. Uh, <laughs> in defense of suicide as a life choice. Look, the gift of life, the precious gift of life, we're being told about this all the time. But what sort of gift is a gift that you can't return? You see, giving back that precious gift of life, returning it, suiciding isn't that easy. And a gift that you can't return, well, that's not a gift at all. A gift you can't return, that's a burden. So what I'm going to be suggesting today is that we should make that gift of life, that precious gift of life, easier to return. And I'm going to suggest that if we do that, society will benefit, and in very quantifiable ways. I'm going to suggest that if you make suicide easier, for example, the net life expectancy of the population will increase and certainly the quality of the lives that people live in that population will increase. Well, paradox perhaps sounds paradoxical, but it's based on a long 20-year experience now working with elderly and terminally ill people. So, the proposition tonight that we make sure we issue reliable drugs, end-of-life drugs, to the rational elderly, so that they can, if they wish, at the time of their choosing, rationally suicide. So that's the, that is, that's the proposition that I'm going to be putting for you tonight. Look, the, the, the dominant medical discourse, the discourse on suicide in our society is that it's a medical issue. The people who are suicidal are suffering from some possibly undiagnosed mental condition, usually depression. And the treatment should be addressing that medical issue in uh, a medical manner. It's a medical discourse. And the argument goes that people, uh, people who are wanting to suicide, many in the medi medical profession believe that that in itself is evidence of mental disease. There's no such thing as rational suicide, is the argument. And it's an oxymoron. And if a person indicates any, indica any suggestion that they wish to suicide, society puts immense obstacles in their path. And in severe cases, of course, you can be taken away against your will and detained, compulsorily, have your freedom restricted, to protect yourself from yourself. Now, the problem with this medical model, of course, the problem with this medical model, is that there's a growing amount of evidence that people who want to end their lives do, in fact, have medical capacity. And by medical capacity, I mean they do have the ability to make decisions in their best interest. So much of the suicide by people is rational suicide, and it's the rational suicides, people who know what they're trying to do, that I think, as society, should be supporting. Now, in a sense, the law agrees with this, you see, suicide's not a crime. As far as the law is concerned, you can go home tonight and kill yourself. The law doesn't care. It's not a crime. Now, there is an additional or an associated piece of legislation, though, a law which makes it a crime to assist a suicide. That is indeed a crime. In fact, it's a very serious crime, not just a slap on the wrist crime. Assisting a suicide can attract savage penalties indeed. In fact, in the Enlightened place where we all live here, in the Northern Territory, the penalty for assisting, that is helping someone to do something which is lawful, the penalty can be life imprisonment, the most savage penalty the state can issue. And there's a paradox here, you can see it straight away. And you can see the consequence that we outlaw to such a degree assistance to suicide, well, people can't get assistance, you can't get information about this lawful act that you may have rationally decided to pursue. And so, what will happen then, what will happen of course if you can't get assistance is that people feel isolated when they are isolated. They become anxious about it and they become desperate without information. And desperate people do desperate things and it's no surprise that the commonest method used by the elderly 2016, the commonest method used to kill themselves is by hanging. Surprising? Well, not really. You don't need to know anything to hang yourself because you can't get information. You don't need to know anything, and rope is certainly available. And by hell, it works. Hanging works. But it's a grim and a horrible death, and I think it's a statistic 
that our society should be ashamed of. But it's there. Now, what if the American psychiatrist Thomas Sass was right in his essay, The Untamed Tongue, in 1990, when he wrote, Suicide is a fundamental human right, and it's one that society has no moral right to interfere with. So individual agency over suicide, it's not exactly a new idea, but the real question is, how do we give acts, how do we give practice to this right? For example, with the introduction of voluntary euthanasia or assisted suicide laws or legislation, would that be the answer? Well, no, it wouldn't. And let me explain why. Look, 20 years ago, and it is exactly 20 years ago, I worked with a piece of voluntary euthanasia assisted suicide legislation here in the Northern Territory. And what those laws, that law and subsequent laws that have passed around the world in the last 20 years do, is that they effectively look at a person who is just about dead. Sit at such a severe degree of illness that there's no turning back. And if they are just about dead, the medical profession are invited in to assess them. And if they are just about dead, the medical profession gets the role of gatekeeper. Gatekeeper to decide if you get permission to go ahead and get help to die. And I used that law. Four of my terminally ill patients sought permission from me, the doctor, to take that step. And they, affected, in the end, got the deaths that they wanted. Now, Dr. Deb Campbell, an Australian academic, in her book just published, Doing It Slowly, which is an analysis of euthanasia laws around the world and euthanasia practice and legislation, describes these legislative models as not only but also models. N-O-B-A, models. And what she means by that is not only do you have to be just about dead, but also you've got to ask consent, permission from the medical profession, the gatekeepers. Now, models like this trash the concept of suicide being a fundamental human right. A fundamental human right is not one you go off and ask permission from your doctor for. And on top of that, these laws don't work particularly well in any, in any event. They don't address many of the situations that people find themselves in. What if you are not quite sick enough to make the cut? You're disenfranchised from using such models. And what if you don't, what if you have a non-medical reason? What if you're not sick and you want to die? There's no answer there with an N-O-B-A model. People like my mother, for example. There she is, when? Gwen was 94 in a nursing home in Adelaide. She wanted to die, but she wasn't sick. Well, at 94, she wasn't particularly well either, but she wasn't sick, and she needed help in a lot of things. She needed help to get around. She had to have some of her food cut up. She needed help in showering. She said that all her friends had gone at her age. All her friends had gone. She said her, she said her looks had gone too. She said, I don't want to be here, I want to die. And I said, she said, when they look, new laws will come in. If they change, I said, the trouble is, when you won't qualify because you're not sick. Maybe if you've got some god-awful disease like cancer, well then maybe you'd qualify, but not on any of the, any of the existing models. So Gwen was very upset and distressed about that, that there was not much on offer there. What about, what about Richard? Richard came and saw me a few months back and he said, look, I'm 85, he said, my wife died four years ago and I've had a good innings, he said, and now's the time to go. I said, uh, Richard, you wouldn't qualify if the law's changed. You're not sick. See, that's the social reason for wanting to die. And David and Carol. <laughs> this was a situation about a year back that came to me. David and Carol, you see, David and Carol had been married together for 60 years. Now, David was dying. He didn't have long to go. He had lung cancer. But Carol came to me and she said, when David dies, I want to die with him. We've been together for 60 years and I want to die with him. 
I said, Carol, you're not sick? And she said, I want to die with him. You see, what Carol is asking for there would be assistance and help to die for a social reason, a non-medical reason. She would never be considered by the not only, but also legislative models. So these laws, these not only but also models, they may not be your or my reasons for wanting to take this course, but that's the point. It shouldn't be us imposing our thoughts and our assessments and judgments on these people who make these rational decisions. You see, when I first started using this legislation 20 years ago, the one that we had briefly here, I used to accept without question my privileged role as a doctor. And I would go around and I'd meet people who wanted to use the law and I would assess them to see whether or not they were sick enough to qualify. I would apply my suffering template and if they fitted that template, well, come in. If they didn't, sorry, come back when you're sick enough. I would sit there and judge. And when I think back about that time, you know, the appalling and insufferable arrogance and paternalism of that position, I'm ashamed at the way I behaved. And I could have stayed that way too. But then I met Lisette. There's Lisette. Colourful character, Lisette. A French expat. She'd spent her working life as the publicity officer in the Waldorf Osteria in New York and she retired. Fate had her retiring in Perth, Western Australia. And when I ran a meeting over there, she came up at the end of the meeting and she said, Doctor, I want some information and advice. I'm going to be dying in four years' time. I said, oh, what sort of a disease is this, Lisette? It's got a very concrete trajectory. <laughs> and Lisette said, oh, I'm not sick. I'm not sick at all. She said, but in four years' time, I'm 76 now, I'll be 80, and 80 is the time to die. And I thought, oh, yes. People say all sorts of things. I didn't take her seriously. But every time I was back in the West and I talked to her, the situation didn't change. The story remained the same. And after four years, she came back again. She said, uh, I want to have some information and some advice. And I said, for goodness sake, I was getting annoyed and somewhat frustrated by this woman. I said, for goodness sake, Lisette, you're not sick. Why don't you go on a world cruise? Why don't you write a book? And she said, Doctor, why don't you mind your own business? <laughs> this has nothing to do with you. What I want from you is technical information. If it's going to come with a sermon, forget it. Her words. And I was embarrassed about that and ashamed. And of course, you see, what Lisette was saying was correct. I mean, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about a fundamental human right? Are we talking about some conferred medical privilege. And that's the problem. Legislative solutions which don't acknowledge that suicide is a fundamental human right are doomed to fail. At best, they will be stopgap measures. I want more than that. I want our society, I want people, elderly people in our society to be provided with reliable, peaceful, end of life drugs Drugs like this, Nembutal Elixir. Now that's a full page colour ad out of the Women's Weekly in 1955. Very available drug back in the 50s, but heavily restricted now. Toxin, taste, colour, appeal and miscibility. Amazing drug. Took the right amount, good night's sleep, took a bit more and you died. And plenty of people who wanted that permanent sleep took that drug for just that purpose in the days when it was readily available. You will have heard of some of them, Judy Garland, Marilyn, even Jimi Hendrix got that sweet, permanent Nembutal sleep. But those days have gone. This is a heavily restricted drug now. But it is the drug that's used, and it was the drug I used here in Darwin, and it is the drug that's used in the places around the world which have gone down this path of introducing not only, but also legislative models. The first person to use the law here in Darwin was Bob Dent. There he is on the left there. 
Now, Bob Dan was dying a hard death here in Darwin, a hard death from prostate cancer, and he actually said to me that he felt he was in the right place at the right time because he was dying just at the time when the law changed to allow access to one of these new, not only, but also models. But he did have some concerns, and he made them clear to me. He said, well, I do want to use this law, but he said, I'll have to get permission. I said, you will have to get permission. You'll have to get it from your doctor. I'm your doctor. I'll give you permission. But you've also got, because of the way the law was structured, to get permission from another doctor, a psychiatrist. Now, Bob didn't want to do that. He didn't feel he should have to. By forcing him to, I felt I was making him jump through hoops, this very sick man. But that's the way the legislation was framed. And when I showed him the drug, the Nemutel, I showed him the bottle of Nemutel like that, and he looked at it, and he said, no, that's the drug. I said, once you drink that or inject that drug, it'll put an end to the suffering that you're going through. He looked at the drug and he said, well, if I had that in the cupboard, I'd just wait till the time was right, then I'd go to the cupboard and take the drug. And of course he was right. And it made me think about this issue. Now, as it was, Bob did satisfy the criteria. He did go off and see a psychiatrist. He did have his sanity check. He did get some measure, small perhaps measure of control. He used the machine of mine on the right there, my deliverance machine. So he pressed the button and the button allowed him to answer this very clear question on the screen of the laptop. Do you wish to live or do you wish to die? And Bob pressed yes. But the point about it is, and as Bob was saying, if he had the drug, should we have been making this man jump through these hoops? Again, are we talking about a fundamental right? Are we talking about some privilege conferred by generally the medical profession. Now, Bill Gates said, the internet changes everything, and by hell, Bill was right. The situation has changed a lot in the last 20 years, and for the better. You see, what the internet has done is it's freed up the flow of information and through the internet, access to materials and products. By freeing up information, you can see what Bob Dent could have done is that he could have done his own research. He would have found out about the drug. He could have acquired it on the internet. He could have put it in the cupboard safely and then when the time was right, he could have taken the drug and peacefully died. He would not have been made to jump through the hoops that that particular piece of legislation forced him to. And that's the situation we're in now. Those people who say and argue that controlling a way a person lives and ultimately how they die through censorship and restriction of information. With the advent of the information, those days are gone. And as far as its impact on the euthanasia and end of life issue, it's changed immeasurably. Just like the war on drugs has failed, as far as this issue is concerned, the stable door is wide open and the euthanasia horse has bolted. With the freer access to these drugs. Now, I don't think we should say that's such a bad thing. You'll get those out there, those harbingers of doom, and say, this is dreadful. We've got to reel us back. We've got to impose further restrictions here to keep the population safe from itself. You can't have free access to these drugs because people will be out there misusing it. Once the drugs are available, there'll be an epidemic of suicides. There'll be a mounting pile of corpses up outside as people get access to these drugs. It's not... It's, based on the intellectually rigorous notion that the only reason any of us are alive is because we haven't yet learned out how to die. <laughs> and as soon as someone tells us, oh hell, let's get out there and do it. Look, it's not true. We're alive because we want to be alive. But what we want, I'm uh, saying that about you, but what I want, and maybe many of you, what I want is choice and I want to be able to make that most fundamental choice in life. My organisation, X International, is made of thousands of people who also want that choice, to make that choice themselves. Many of them have got the drugs, they've sourced them and purchased them, and they've got them safely stored. 
And they, as they tell me often, are now living the best years of their life because they know they have absolute control. They hope they'll never need those drugs, but it's immensely comforting and reassuring when you've got them. And it's out of that comfort and reassurance comes the increase in life expectancy because people are happier. So what I'm proposing tonight is that every person over the age of 70 be issued with 15 grams of sodium pentobarbital, aka Nembutal, to safely store to be used if and when they like. Long shelf life, 20 years, you've got the itch that particular issue stitched up. That's the proposition. Society will benefit, people will live longer and happier lives, and because of the feeling of well-being, we'll see benefits in society. I know one person who would have benefited, my mother. I would have loved to have been able to give Gwen that drug. And I know the effect it would have had on her. I don't know whether she would have taken it or not, but I know she would have been immensely relieved and it would have done much to alleviate the misery that she went through in those last five years in that nursing home. Because she didn't have choice. As it was Gwen died at Christmas. Just one of the many people denied this life's most fundamental choice. Thank you.